All right. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Sue Keisler, Vice President of the Board of Partnership for Extraordinary Minds, or X Minds as we're known. First, the Spanish speakers in the audience, um, I, I wanna have our Spanish interpreter, Sabrina, give you instructions for finding the Spanish audio channel. Um, she recorded it earlier and I'm going to play it for you. Para escuchar esta presentación en español, acá clic en la opción de menú Interpretación y seleccione Español. Okay. Thanks, Sabrina. And um, for anybody who's arriving later, those instructions are going to be written in the chat as well. So as we're looking at the last days of the school year, a lot of us are looking for inspiration for summer reading for our kids. And for those of us with a neurodivergent child, it's especially exciting to find out about authors whose stories include autistic characters. With that in mind, we are very pleased to bring to you tonight a panel of six incredibly creative and talented authors of children's and young adult literature. All our authors include in their books central characters who are autistic. And as these authors identify as autistic themselves, these characters are drawn from the author's own lived experience. We've also invited as our moderator, Mira Trahan. And I wanted to mention that not only is Mira our moderator tonight, uh, she is also the person who proposed to x Minds the idea of having a panel of autistic authors. And she was very helpful in putting this together. Mira is a local author herself. She's published the middle grade novel, The View from the Very Best House in Town which centers around two autistic middle school characters. This story has been received has received great reviews and was chosen as an Amazon editor's pick, a Book Riot February must read, and a Junior Library Guild gold selection. Mira is a longtime member of X Minds, and we are very grateful to her for moderating our panel tonight. In just a minute, Mira and our panelists are going to introduce themselves and begin the discussion. At around eight o'clock, we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. Audience members, please go ahead and put your questions in the chat at any time in Spanish or English. You don't have to wait until the Q&A begins. I know we're all eager to get started and hear from our guest author. So Mira, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Sue. And thank you to X Minds for hosting this event um, and being so receptive um, when, when I raised it with them. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us this evening. For those of you who aren't as familiar with the children's literature scene, this panel of six authors is an absolute rock star panel. Not only have they written highly praised, award-winning, and best-selling books, but more importantly, what they write entertains, moves, and makes a real difference in kids' lives, and I can say from my own experience in adult lives too. Um, in addition, they use their talents to advocate for a more inclusive society. I'm honored to introduce them and to be here with them tonight. So I'm um, getting started. First up, we have Tiffany Hammond. She's the author of A Day With No Words, a picture book that debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. A New York Times profile about the book noted it's over 777 Amazon five-star reviews. Um, last time I checked, it was up to 849. In the words of one reviewer, the importance of a day with no words cannot be overstated. She is an, also an autism consultant and the voice behind the Fidgets and Fries blog. Ivelisse Hausman is an illustrator and the author of the young adult fantasy, Unseely, the first in a duology. It has been described as sparkling with mystery, adventure, and enchantment. And having just read it, I can attest that that's true. She is also um, an artist and illustrator. Mike Jung is the author of the middle grade novels, The Boys in the Back Row, Unidentified Suburban Object, Geeks, Girls, and Secret Identities, and he's a contributor to various anthologies, including most recently, You Are Here. His books have been described as witty, original, and hilarious. He's also a founding member of We Need Diverse Books. Sarah Caput is the author of Get a Grip, Baby Cohen, which won a Schneider Family Honor, The Many Mysteries of the Finkel Family, and the just released Second Chance Summer. Her characters have been described as nuanced and heartwarming and her stories is undeniably charming. She has longstanding involvement in the disability rights and neurodiversity movements. Lynn Miller Lachman is a translator and author of numerous books, including the middle grade novels, Moonwalking and Rogue, 
the children's biography, She Persisted Temple Grandin, and the YA novels, Gringolandia, Saving Santiago, and most recently, Torch, the winner of this year's Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Young Adult Literature. And finally, we have Sally J. Pla, the author of the picture book, Benji the Bad Day and Me, and the middle grade novels, The Someday Birds, Stanley Will Probably Be Okay, and the forthcoming The Fire, The Water, and Madi McGinn, which has been called A Beautiful Book by a Beautiful Human, which I thought was just a wonderful review. Um, in addition to writing, she runs A Novel Mind, a blog about mental health and neurodiversity in children's literature. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's such a pleasure to have a chance to chat with you all. So getting started into our questions, and for this first question, if there's anything I left off um, in your introduction, please feel free to weave that into. One of the things I love about writing um, is that when you meet authors, there's you learn there's so many different paths to becoming a writer um, and writing books for children. So I would love to hear from each of you about your writing journey um, and how you started writing for children. Lynn, do you wanna get us started since? You've got a lot. Uh, since I've probably been at this for a very, very, very long time, um, because I started writing. Oh, um, I thought I was going to be write the great American novel about uh, 40 years ago. <laughs> and uh, more than that, 45 years ago. And I thought I was I, I was going to write books for adults. And I managed with a um, adult literary manuscript. I got an agent um, sometime in my mid my mid twenties, and she suggested that I consider writing books for teens because at the time I was a high school teacher, and she also felt that the characters, the teenage characters in my books, uh, in my manuscript were the ones that really came alive. And she suggested some contemporary um, YA novels um, of the late 70s and early 80s. And I read them and I just, I mean, I basically fell in love with YA. And since then have really dedicated myself to writing um, for mostly for teens. Although that literary novel eventually, many years later, became an eco-thriller and was published um, for adult readers. It's called Dirt Cheap. Um, and it took me 22 years for my first YA novel, which was Gringolandia, to be published. It came very close in around 1990. Uh, but I lost a contract and kind of quit for 10, 15 years and then came back to it. Um, I guess I'm a lesson in persistence. That, that's wonderful. Sally, could you tell us a little bit about your journey? I think you're muted. Sorry, I got so used to being muted. <laughs> I was just saying I can agree with Lynn. It's definitely a roller coaster ride. Um, I didn't start trying to write for children till around 2014. Um, before then, I was always a writer, but I did different things. I, you know, I, I was a business journalist. I was a magazine editor. I freelanced. I wrote for a, um, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel because we lived in Wisconsin for a while. Um, so I did a bunch of different types of writing, and but I just could not give myself permission to write fiction because who does that, right? You know, who who gives? I just didn't think that I could give myself permission to have fun and do what I my heart really wanted to do um, until I guess you know my my kids were older, you know, and and I you know I raised a very neurodivergent family, and that took a lot of effort too and time. So it wasn't real. This is sort of like a second career for me. I feel like I've done something different every decade of my life. And it's been a long journey also as an autistic person to try to figure out who I am and what it is that I want to really say. So that didn't really happen for me till my 50s. So I didn't start writing until then. I also, this is 
was a late start to writer. So I definitely understand that. Uh, Mike, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure, I'll make an effort to tell you just a little because I can monologue about this for days. Um, uh, I first got the idea to write uh, a children's book when I was in my uh, early 20s. I was a preschool teacher and so I was reading a lot of picture books. And that was when I first had the idea that like, oh, actually people make these. People like actually write these words and draw the pictures and they don't just fall out of the sky. So that was, you know, a, a minor epiphany. And then um, and then I proceeded to not do anything about it for the next uh, 15 years. I did other things. I, you know, I worked in web design. I was uh, I worked in communications. I did um, a variety of other stuff. I worked with I continued to work with kids for a little while. Um, but it was when I it was really when um, my oldest, uh, our oldest uh, was born that um, I thought uh, maybe I'll get back to trying to write that book, partly because my main creative outlet at the time was playing music and I did not want to be, you know, hanging out at bars all night and banging on the guitar um, in, in our tiny apartment and waking the baby up. So I thought I would try something quieter and that and it turned out that that urge to write was still there. Um, and um, I tried writing a picture book again and writing picture books is so hard. It's so hard. So, um, and, and uh, uh, my, my writing voice coming out was naturally just both more verbose and older. And so that's when I um, realized that my first book and the two that came after it were gonna be middle grade novels. So um, I started attending conferences and I started um, doing workshops and things and, um, it was, uh, and then I, I, uh, you know, discovered social media, um, which has been a godsend for me, um, speaking specifically as an autistic person. Um, I don't know that I have a career without it because that's how I've made so many of the connections with people that I have in this business. Um, and that is actually how I, um, ended up, um, getting, uh, a the, the first request for my manuscript from an editor who was Arthur Levine, who was at the time was at Scholastic. And he, um, he ended up publishing that first book, which is uh, my debut, Geeks, Girls, and Secret Identities. Sadly, it's going out of print. So if you want one, you should order like 20 copies of it now. Um, and I, I started writing and getting published before I understood that I'm autistic. Um, and like a, lot of, like a lot of parents of autistic children, um, it was the process of um, pursuing uh, diagnosis and clarity for our child that brought that same clarity to me. And so um, and so I came to this much later in life, like similar to how Sally's did. And and uh, I so my first three novels, which are out there, my only three novels, the first I say that optimistically, I say my first three um, are not explicitly on the page about autistic characters, although um, autistic friends are always telling me that they read as autistic and that they, they assume the characters are autistic because it just came through apparently. Um, and so that that's an interesting phenomenon. Um, so actually the only stories I have right now where I um, explicitly declare the, the characters to be autistic on the page are in um, anthologies, including, uh, including You Are Here, which is um, an anthology that just came out from um, Alita Books, um, which is Lindy Sue Park's new imprint at HarperCollins. Um, and, and that is um, the second story that I've, short story that I've written about um, an openly autistic character. And, but uh, they're all gonna be about autistic characters from now on. That's terrific. And um, I could definitely identify with Mike when he talked about how hard picture books are. I too started that way and have not cracked that nut yet, but Tiffany, um, you certainly have. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your writing journey? Um, uh, yeah, um, I never wanted to be a, a children's book writer, like at all. It's just, I feel like it just like, I stumbled into it. <laughs> like it wasn't, in my plan um writing is is something that i've been doing since i was really young i was like seven when i wrote like my first story 
and I didn't really like have friends and didn't talk to too many people and they couldn't understand me. So my grandma taught me to write. They don't hear me speak, hear me on the paper. So write. So I've basically just been writing since then nonstop every single day. And that's how I make sense of the world. And that's how I understand myself and other people. And it's like my lifeline. <laughs> like I know like one day I like shared that the the moment that I no longer have a passion for writing is the day that I'm gonna stop doing any other things that I'm doing, like advocating, like doing all because it's that important to me. Like writing is not a, a hobby for me, it's literally life for me. <laughs> like, like I literally have to write something about anything so notebooks everywhere but I thought my first book was going to be this big amazing novel that was going to get Oprah's attention and I was going to sit in her garden and we were going to have a conversation and I started getting like messages from editors and and publishers and agents and they were like hey we want you to write a book and I'm like yes Oprah I'm coming and then they would send the next email and be like a children's book and I'm just sitting here like what what about my platform because that's how they all found me is through my platform through fidgets and fries and I'm like and I'm talking about all this 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 heavy stuff this life things that I'm going through all the time and 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 a lot of it is difficult and challenging and hard. And they're like, she looks like the first person for children's book. And I'm like, so the first few times I bucked it, I was like, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. And I think around the third editor um, that came around and she's like, give it a try. And that was the first time that I really, really tried. And ultimately, we didn't end up working together, but it stuck with me. Like the idea stuck with me. So I was like, the next time someone comes to me, this is what I'm going to show them. This is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm going to do. And so when my current publisher of this book reached out and said, hey, I want to talk to you about writing a book. And then I was like, let me guess, a children's book. You know, so I'm like, I got one, I pitched it, I, and it took, they're not lying when they say children's picture books are hard, right? They are so incredibly hard, right? And it was the hardest thing I ever wrote in my life. And they were like, no more than 600 words. And I'm like, y'all have not met me. Like, a, one actual post that I, I have a paragraph of my posts that are like 600 words. So like, how am I supposed to do that and then make it entertaining and then make the kids and the, and, the, and the adults who read to them want to stay engaged and want to read it from front to back and then learn something and be educated by it and then want to share it. And I'm like, it was definitely the hardest thing ever. that like hands down and to think I'd never even do it. And so I... I'm just riding this this wave right now. I don't know what's coming next for me. I don't know what I want to get into um, next. I'm just I'm just writing, and I'm still writing. And I don't know what's next for me, but I'm just excited to be here and, and be here with all these amazing authors. And I'm learning so many things already and getting inspired already. I'm like. I don't want to write a young adult, not that now. Like, like just, I'm just like hearing all these beautiful things from each person. And I, I just, yeah, this has been one long, long, long journey. And it feels like one extra long day, like from <laughs> age seven to like, May. <laughs> like there's one big old day and I haven't slept. So, but yeah, that's it. Well, that's great. And honestly, like with this book, if, if, if a picture book is going to land up on Oprah, this is like one that 
really, really should be there. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed for that or your next novel. Sarah, do you want to tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure. And um, just as just so you know, if you see a cat on one of my screen that his name is Allie, he'll probably be making an appearance. Um, he's right here, right here off the edge of the screen. But um, yeah, so I, for a long time, I've always loved books and writing. And when I was a kid, I used to say, oh, I want to be a writer. But then as I got older, I sort of developed this idea that I wasn't creative enough to write fiction. And so I pursued other things. I, um, I've i always kind of really, I've been a nerd about research. And so I decided to go to graduate school. Um, I guess like a lot of other people who don't know what to do with their lives. I went to um, get a PhD in history from UCLA, which I did, and that was a great experience. I loved research, um, but unfortunately, I it's really hard to get a job from that. And I was very laser focused for a long time on being a history professor, and I applied for all the jobs, and it just didn't work out for me, which is pretty common, um, And but it was pretty disheartening. And so then that was around 2015 when I, I graduated, and I was just... Um, kind of so uh, at the same time disheartened by it that I just decided, okay, well, why not just um, pick up your, your other dream of just writing a book? And at that point, yeah, I didn't really see it being a career or anything, but I decided, okay, I'm finally going to write a book. And so my first book actually I did have a historical tie-in. It was a YA and it was fantasy, but it was tangentially related to my historical research. So it sort of had a footing in that world. But to my surprise, I found I could finish it and I could like it. And um, so I wrote another book. This one was Middle Grade, which I kind of realized naturally that's sort of where I'm, I'm good, where my, my voice is at its best. And um, so um, and that book didn't get published, but then one after one uh, that did. And that, that's my debut, Get It, Get It, Get It, with Cohen. And so I just sort of kind of fell into it after something else that I tried didn't quite work out. And now I'm glad that it didn't because although I love the research aspects of being historian, the teaching, while sometimes rewarding, is frankly not for me. I admire everyone who teaches in whatever capacity because I discovered that wasn't quite for me and um, that this is a job that, even with all of its challenges, really does suit me better. And so I, I was sort of fell into it accidentally, but I'm really so glad that it worked out this way. I am too. Um, Evelise, do you want to tell us about your journey? Uh, yeah. Um, the one thing I need to add to my bio, I think, is uh, I'm a biracial Latina author, and I am a recipient of the Letras Boricuas uh, Fellowship Grant for Puerto Rican authors. So that is a huge achievement for me. But um, I think unlike everyone else, not everyone else here, but I think I'm in the minority when I say I've always wanted to write for kids. Like uh, my very first book I wrote before I could write and my dad held the pencil and I told him what to say. I have a time capsule from when I was 10 years old where I said that my dream for the future was to win a Newberry, which was a pretty lofty goal for a 10 year old. <laughs> Um, but I, um, always, I was kind of like a, a, a hyperlexic kid. I was always, you know, reading above my grade level. So I've been in love with middle grade and young adult books for as long as I can remember really. And, um, uh, when I got to my freshman year of college, um, I, I knew that I always wanted to write, but I thought it would be like a side thing and I would come back to it someday because I was so good at academics. And then I hit my freshman year of college and I crashed and burned because I had just gotten my autism diagnosis. I didn't have an IEP. I didn't have any supports in place to help me through that transition. And I realized that like academia was not going to be an option for me. And I needed to figure out some kind of career that I could do um, that would lean into my strengths instead of like pushing myself further into this like burnout and frustration about things I couldn't do. So um, while I was in college studying graphic design, which I figured I could do because you don't have to write papers, um, I wrote my first book and I returned to the books that I like felt most passionate about. And I realized like a lot of them were middle grade books. So that was my first book. And um, it was kind of a train wreck, but I applied for a mentorship program with it. And Sarah Caput actually ended up picking me as her mentee, um, which was 
it was amazing for me at that point as like a 19 year old to be mentored by an older autistic person who was in the career that I wanted to be in. I didn't like, I was a teenager when I was diagnosed, like I didn't have any role models. I felt so alone in the world. And then like, here's this older successful person who has a book coming out with an openly autistic character who like saw that potential in me. And that meant so much to me. So um, she helped me edit that first book. And then I realized that like my strengths and my passion were more in the young adult category. Uh, which is when I started focusing on writing my debut book on Sealy, which came out in January. Um, and I love, I love middle grade and young adults. Like I, I just love writing for younger readers, especially with on Sealy, because I wanted to write the book that I wished that I had had when I was a teenager who had just been diagnosed with autism and had no idea what that meant for me. So I love, I've heard from readers that it has sort of been that book for them and that means the absolute world to me. So Eva Lisa, I'm gonna stick with you to start off our second question because you're talking about Unsealy. Can you tell us um, a little bit more about um, kind of where you got the idea specifically for Unsealy in the process of writing that book? Yeah, I, um... I was inspired by a theory I encountered that changeling mythology uh, was an early description of autistic children. So the idea that, which kind of persists to this day in a weird way, that um, people believe that like the fairies would steal your baby and replace it with an inhuman baby and that those inhuman fairy traits were actually, you know, autistic traits. like you know, having too much vocabulary or not enough and not relating to people and being too sensitive and like all of these things. So I thought it would be really fun to take that concept, which is, you know, generally a negative thing and spin it from an autistic perspective in a fantasy world. Um, since fantasy and like young adult fantasy was like the the heart of so many books that I was obsessed with and so I really wrote it you know with that driving the story like the main character is an autistic changeling and she feels like you know she's living in this world that wasn't built for her and like she doesn't belong but she is surrounded by she she was chosen by her parents and she's surrounded by characters who do accept her for who she is and so much so much of it is about her accepting her autistic identity but it's also just a fantasy adventure because it's like I I didn't have that and I was like I I'm not like a contemporary literary person like I want there to be dragons and sword fights and I just wanted it to be something that like fun that people could pick up so that was um the inspiration for that okay and Tiffany you told us some of your journey and, and how um, I want you to for children, um, but uh, specifically, you know, A Day With No Words resonates with so many people, and there's been such, um, you know, a reception of how needed this book was, and so I'd love to hear you talk about that, but also, um, I thought kind of craft-wise, you made really interesting choice in choosing to tell the story with um, people using AAC to communicate, like the main characters using that sort of both the mother and the child. So if you want to talk a little bit about how your process for writing and how you came up with the idea, I'd love to hear more about that. Actually, the idea came from one of the editors who reached out. They were like, we want you to write a children's book. And I'm like, I don't even know where to begin. Like I write stories for my kids and I wrote a lot of them for them when they were growing up. And I would write them, then read it to them. Um, but this felt different. And then she sent me a link and she said, do it on this post, about this post. And I clicked on it and it was a post that I wrote about these days that I have with our family where we don't talk and we call them no talk days. And I had almost forgotten I wrote that post. And that was probably one of my first viral posts. And I was like, oh, okay, let me see what I can do with this. And 
it just, the more I sat with it, the more I felt like, yeah, this has to be the book that I write about. Because it was more of me sitting with the idea coupled with what I was noticing when our family went out and when they interacted with my son and when they see my son and the things that they say and the things that they do and how they act. And I was like, this, yeah, this has to be the book. I just need to figure out how to write it. Um, so it's based on our lives. It's literally every piece that's in it has happened to us, with us, about us. Um, on any one of those particular days, I just kind of mushed them together. Um, but it was taking from pieces of our lives and things that we already do, and then trying to write it in a way that would be relatable to to children, and not only children, but the the people that the adults that read to them. I wanted them to to see you know, not only, you know, their children in the story, but also maybe themselves in the story or um, find it relatable in some way. And I think it made it easier to write this incredibly challenging story because it was um, centered in, in our lives, in what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it was just trying to figure out how to put that to paper, how to put that into a book and how to share about autism in a way that didn't feel um, academic. And that was like one of the main things. And that's one of the main things I do on my platform. It's just like, I don't wanna be academic about autism. Like I don't, like ever, I don't want to like say, this is what autism is. This is red flags. This is symptoms. This is a meltdown. This is this. Don't ever do that. I want to tell stories and I want to reach people and I'm in the feelings business. So this story had to like hit people right in the center of their chest and like, like really know. And I, I, that's, the, the biggest thing that I was trying to do and the most challenging thing I've ever had to try to do because I wasn't making it up. And I think that's what makes it harder because like this is your, this was literally our lives that I put into a story and then I put it out into the world. And then I'm like, what if someone comes across it and says, they don't like what you put out. Does it, does it mean that they don't like my life? Do they mean they don't like our life? They don't like what we we're doing. They don't like what. So that's also what kind of made this book even harder to write because I wasn't creating this 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 life. These characters were real to me as my son. This is what he does. This is what we do. I use my advice with him. He uses it with me. This was what I think. So it's. In a lot of ways, it was simple because it was my life. And then in a lot of ways, it's difficult because it was my life. And trying to, to find that, um, trying to, trying to find a, this pocket that I could sit in where I could get it done. And hopefully people would find it enjoyable was, was incredibly uh, challenging, but um happy with the result <laughs> um and I just hope that that this book um helps people to understand a little bit more about not only non-speakers but like their families as well and how those around them that love and care for them also experience all these different um things um, from other people and an environment and everything like that. So I just hope people liked it and <laughs> they learned from it and they wanted to share it with other people as well. Yeah. So and I think one reason it um, 
has resonated with so many people is because it does have that truth to it. At least when I read it, I, I definitely felt that way and that people could see, you know, their own lives and, and their own interactions that they've had reflected in that book. So um, congratulations, Sarah, you have several books. Do you want to pick one of them to tell us a little bit more about the story behind the story? Sure, absolutely. So I'll talk a little bit about my debut, Get a Grip of the Cohen, since this was the book that kind of started it all for me. And so when I come up with a book, it's usually several ideas coming together, things that I'm passionate about, experiences in my life. And with this one, it was a few things. It was first that I started writing it 2017, which um, at that point, the state of autistic representation in kids' books was so poor compared to today. There was only a handful. I think Lynn's book was one of the few that was on the shelf with an explicitly autistic character. And so obviously that was frustrating. And I especially wanted to do an autistic girl because I think, um, although again, that's something that's getting much better. I think there's still a lot of misperceptions around um, uh, 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 autism as being so a so-called boy's condition. So that was one thing. And then there was, um, it's a baseball book. So then there was my lifelong love of baseball. And um, this sounds so sloppy, but um, there was a, TV show called Pitch that has sadly been canceled before its time. But the big thing about this show was that it featured um, a black woman who became the first woman to pitch in Major League Baseball. And when I saw the previews for this, I flipped that I know I, I can't even believe I had this emotional reaction. For me, having spent most of my life loving Major League Baseball and being a woman, but never seeing, of course, a woman play, somehow this fictionalized depiction of a woman on the pitcher's mound just like touched me deeply. So I thought, oh. Um, yeah, no, I agree. It was sabotaged. I, I hate that. I hate what happened to the show. Oh, but anyway, um, so I wanted to, to write, okay, there's a girl who wants to be like the, the woman on pitch. She wants to be a, a major league baseball player. So that came into place. And then the final piece was the epistolary act aspect because it's a book written in letters that Vivi, the main character, writes letters to her favorite baseball player about her life. And this was came from something deeply personal that I think well, one of the reasons why I became a writer is because writing has always been so much easier for me talking. To the point where when I was a child, sometimes when I had something like really important to say to my parents, and I would just write them a letter. And at that point, I wasn't diagnosed. And frankly, I think in retrospect, I probably thought it was the weirdest thing on earth. Like, why is my kid sending me a letter instead of just talking to me about it straight out? But for me, that was the truest way to express my emotions. And so it was natural that kind of a book about an autistic girl would center on letters because the letters, like it was for me, was the true, her true way of being able to express herself in a way that kind of she couldn't with verbal words. And so um, once all of those elements fell together, it just kind of the book clicked. And actually that was one of my, my more easy writing processes, but usually that's kind of how it works for me. I take some things like something that I'm interested in, some experience that I have, and it sort of just gels together to hopefully create something that's not quite my life. I mean, I've people ask me all the time, have you played baseball? The answer is no, I played softball badly for a year or two. Um, but it's just the, the emotions are, are mine and they're based on the emotions that I had. And that's sort of how, how it all coalesces for me. Thank you. Mike, would you like to tell us about one of yours, the story behind the story for one of your books? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I think I will talk about um, not one of my novels, but a short, the most recent short story, the one that's in You Are Here, which is, um, which is called Henry, which is the name of the, the main character. Clever, right? Um, and his, um, his name is Henry Yoon. And you know, my writing has taken sort of an interesting arc because my first book was a superhero novel, which is exactly what I wanted to write. I wanted to write something with um, like muscular people in spandex and capes and giant robots and air aerial battles and a spaceship descending from the sky. And for a long time, you know, my standard joke was that all my books are going to have a spaceship descending from the sky, even if it's like, you know, a book that's uh, about a bitter divorced couple. But um, but I have um, steadily moved away from um, speculative fiction and into uh, contemporary realistic fiction, which is not at all what I expected. Um, but, uh, and I don't know how much of that is due to the fact that um, uh, my understanding of myself as being autistic, you know, continues to deepen over time, because in a lot of ways, I'm still 
much closer to the beginning of that particular um, journey of self-knowledge than I am to the end. Um, but um, this, uh, this, my story and you are here is something that um, I was invited to do. So I was invited by the editor, Ellen O, um, who uh, is, she's she's been a friend of mine. We've, we've been friends since we were both just getting started in querying agents and things before either of us had gotten published. And so, um, she, and she's she's been one of my um, beta readers and critique group members for um, for most of that time. And so we're very we're very good friends. And she invited me to contribute to this anthology, which is um, a, a, like a highly collaborative thing where it's um, each story by different authors all set in the same uh, place. And they're all set in a Chicago airport. And what happens is that the first story, which was written by Christina Sunderbott, um, involves an episode of racism which kind of echoes through uh, the rest of the anthology and the stories are connected in that um uh the events of one will affect the events of the other and the the, the characters make cameo appearances in each other's stories so it was a really fun process but originally i said no because um because it was still just a proposal and i was feeling very conscious of like wanting to get you know wanting to get paid for for work and wanting to actually work on a novel which I have since shelved despite spending five years on it. Um, painful. Um, but I, I did say no initially because I said, like, I, I want to focus on the novel. And if there isn't, like, you know, uh, real money involved yet, um, I'm just going to have to pass because I feel like it's going to divide my attention too much. And so um, Ellen said, OK. And then she came back a year later and she said, OK, so now we're still doing this anthology. Now I've got a final list of contributors except for you. And I still want you to contribute to this one. And she said, and now there's money. So um, and uh, she secured a very good deal for, for the anthology. And it turned out it's because it is the flagship uh um, publication from Alita Books and the the very first their their inaugural publication. So it was you know kind of a big deal and it's done very well. Um, and so when I said yes this time, um, I knew that it was going to be um, I, I knew that I was going to be writing an autistic character because I had already made that decision that all of my work going forward for the foreseeable future is going to feature autistic protagonists. Um, and I thought this would be an interesting exercise, creative exercise, in that it is a book that is explicitly about race, and racism is is a, a big element of the story. And so I felt, um, I thought, yeah, I'm. It's going to force me to be intersectional about the way I write this story because um, I I am not going to make autism and neurodivergence the point of the story. I'm not going to make it a struggle in the story. I really don't want to be doing that right now. Um, but it's going to be like, I, I, I wanted to also make sure that I was writing about both an autistic child and his autistic parent, because that's a dynamic, you know, in, in my family and in a lot of families that I know of autistic people. And, um, and I thought that seemed ripe for exploration. Um, and also because it's, you know, something that uh, happens with my family, I have a lot of raw material to draw on. And so, um, so that was uh, very interesting. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm verbose, and I'm not natural, naturally uh, concise with my writing. So writing a short story, I've written two of them now, but, um, but it, it's been a challenging, you know, exercise in, uh, in creativity to do it each time. Um, and this was a very fun project in that we were very much collaborating. So we had a lot of Zoom calls with all of us. We're scattered all over the country, you know, to talk about, um, you know, maintaining consistency and continuity and, and um, thematic unity, but also making sure that we reach telling distinct stories. Um, and there, there are not a lot of stories about um, uh, Asian American autistic characters out there right now. Um, and um, so it felt like I wanted to avoid thinking of myself as being, you know, a pioneer, trailblazer, et cetera, like, because I, I have a high capacity for self-aggrandizement and I didn't want to do that. But it also felt very much like this is, this is something that I can contribute because it is a story that I am writing that's very, very true to life for me. Um, and so that is, that is what I did. And there's one Goodreads reviewer out there who reviewed the anthology and actually called my story out as her favorite. So, hooray. Um, so yeah, that's that's the story behind that particular story. 
That's great. And I, I heard Ellen O speaking at a book festival a couple of weeks ago, and she was talking about the massive spreadsheet she had of all the connections that people could have and where they could meet in the airport and the popcorn. Um, the popcorn but, um, was a big deal, yes. <laughs> um, Lynn, would you like to tell us about one of your many books? I think any of them we would love to hear about. Muting first. Okay. I'm going to talk about Torch, uh, which is my most recently published book, um, but also was probably the book that um, I conceived of in a way when I was the youngest, because as a high school student, I was not diagnosed. I was not diagnosed until well in adulthood and not until I had already um, written, I had already published one novel and had another one in production. When I found out that I was autistic, it answered a lot of questions as to why I struggled to fit in and why I had trouble following rules, even though I really wanted to follow those rules. And why I would look at, you know, at what would be very difficult for me to reconcile was the hypocrisy of people uh, saying one thing and doing another, or saying one thing one day and saying something else different the next day. And I think that, childhood experience of not knowing why I was different and not and being such a poor fit for my society really went into the character of Tomash, who was the first character that I came up with in writing Torch. And Torch takes place in Czechoslovakia in 1969. It was the year after the Soviet invasion that crushed a nascent pro-democracy movement known as the Prague Spring. And the story is about three misfit teenagers, Tomáš, Stepan, and Lida, whose mutual best friend sets himself on fire to protest the invasion and the Czech and Slovak people's passivity in the face of it. Instead of sparking the revolution, this friend sparks a, the secret police pursuing all three of his mutual best friends, who are not friends with each other, but they can all consider Pavel their best friend. And they have to find and connect with each other in order to survive. And when I was 16, I sort of admired communism because I thought that it was a society where everyone could fit in and play a role. And over the years, I learned that that wasn't the case. I actually spent some time in a, in a communist country. And my character of Tomas grows up in that society, learning the ideology of collectivism, but also realizing it's not the way his father, who's a party official, says that it is. And he genuinely wants to belong. And he and the other characters create a kind of found family, which becomes a source of resistance against the repression that they are experiencing on the part of the Soviet controlled regime. And the biggest challenge for me, this is a multiple point of view story. And as an autistic person, when I was first diagnosed, I questioned my ability to be able to write from someone else's perspective. And it led me really to focus on the multiple points of view and how different events can be seen from different perspectives. And that's how I developed the characters of Stepan and Lita and the idea essentially of a collective protagonist because their fates, the three teenagers' fates are all intertwined and dependent on the decisions of every single one of them. 
So it was a challenge for me. It got me out of my comfort zone because I'd always written first person, um, present tense point of view, got me out of my comfort zone, but also was a way in which the form of the novel represented the theme of the novel and represented my own quest as an autistic person to understand multiple points of view. Thank you for that. That's and clearly you you mastered it. So um, that is, that's wonderful. Thank you. And Sally, you. would you like to tell us about one of your novels, either that's out or that might be coming out, whatever you prefer? Um. Yeah. I, I guess I'll talk about. I I have what's going to be my third middle grade novel coming out in a month. Exactly, a month it comes out. July 11th, and it's called The Fire, The Water, and Maudie McGing. And it's about a young autistic girl, Maudie, who lives during the school years with her mom and a new stepdad. And in the summers, she spends with her dad, who she loves very much in uh, a mountainside cabin in California. Um, but this is a summer of real tumultuous change after a year of tumultuous change for her with a new stepdad and with, with uh, challenges at school and at home. Uh, and when she goes to stay with her dad, she doesn't really get a chance to, to speak to him about what's been going on. She's been told to be quiet about all of the disruptions and problems at home. Um, and there's immediately, there's a wildfire, they have to evacuate, the mountain cabin summer goes up in ashes, and she ends up in an RV camp by the beach in Southern California, in, because an old high school buddy of dad's has offered them a free RV at the campground to stay at over the summer, since they're pretty much out of options. Um, and it's out of all of this, these like wave after wave of really tumultuous change has, has hit Maudie. Um, but in, in the face of all of that, it's a summer in which she really thrives. It's a crucible that she's in, but she realizes when she's in this sort of RV campground community that it is a community and that her father's friends are lovely and they're caring and people help each other. And there's this beautiful ocean right in front of her. And there's this very interesting, intriguing older woman that surfs every morning that um, she ends up yearning to be in the water and to surf. And the water is her sensory reset. She loves swimming and lo loves the water. And um, learning to surf works on two levels. Of course, it, it goes back to, there's a famous John Kabat-Zinn quote that I really love called, you can't stop the waves of change in life, but you can learn to surf. And pretty much the whole book is a little bit the story of that. And it's my first book. It's a very hopeful book. It, you know, it starts out with, you know, she's facing real challenges, but it's a story of hope and community and love and resilience and forgiveness. And, um, oh, I just really hope you guys want to read it. <laughs> I feel like it's really the book of my heart that I have put more in than anything. Um, Maudie's challenges, and she calls herself the girl with glitches. Um, she, there's a little disconnect and it was something that for me growing up and oh, I also was undiagnosed until I was in a middle-aged person, um, but I raised three autistic boys. You think I would know, you know, that there would be some clue, but yeah. Um, but when I was growing up undiagnosed, I had this glitch just like Maudie in my book where I think things were just, it's like when a film audio is a little off from the video, just a little smidge. So it would take me just like a little extra second to, to understand or figure out what the teacher's directions were or what they were saying or just assimilate what people were, were saying and then to collect my own thoughts and respond. It just took me a little longer and it was just long enough so that it was easier just not to say anything at all. Um, so I was the quiet kid that I just never said a word. Um, and I couldn't go to school more than four or five days in a row without needing a day at home to completely detox and recover from the too muchness of the school. 
Um, you know, a, a lot of stuff that I've given to Madi is my own experiences growing up that I think are still experiences of kids today whose parents may not realize the extent of it or how it feels from within their shoes or how sometimes behaviors stem from sensory experiences of the world that when you're the loving parent and you're encouraging and you may not realize um, you know, how, how far to push or how far to go or what it's really like to live inside the skin of, of your child. And it's it's not a preachy book and it's not about the autism so much. And it's, it's an adventure, you know, and it's we're full of triumphs and success and surfing contests and everything. But, you know, all of that is baked in because it's really, it was really important to me to get at that, at it, you know, that, that sense of what it's like to live inside you know, the, live inside that that body and, and feel those things and think the way Mahdi thinks. And it's why I like to write in first person. All my books are in first person because I want you to feel so close to that protagonist and feel what life is like for, for that child. And I really feel like my books are, they're, they're pegged middle grade, but they're really books for everybody. And I get letters and notes from parents and grandparents as much as I do uh, from children, you know, saying, wow, you know, I never knew, you know, this has really helped open my eyes. And, and, you know, even though it's a story, like, you know, I have another story, and it's about comics trivia and a treasure hunt. And I have another book, and it's about a road trip, you know, across the country. And, you know, they're about, they're not about autism, but yet you will be inside the shoes of somebody, and inside the brain and mentality and heart and soul of somebody that you haven't experienced before. And I want to make you feel that and know that it's really that's what the, is the most important thing to me I think in all my books thank you and I do think um like one reason like from what you're saying and actually what everyone said like when I teach writing a lot of it right it's like about getting to just your truth and making sure like no matter what else is on the page no matter how whether it's a fantasy whether it's first person whether it's third person whether it's multiple point of view or not but they you are getting your truth across and that it's not worth trying to publish like your name is on it. And if that's not, you know, how you see the world and your truth of the world, then what's even the point. So I really appreciate that. And it's really beautiful. And I'm going to stick with you for a quick final, we'll sort of do a lightning round question before we go to Q and a, but this panel is titled inspiration for summer reading. And is there a book or two you've told us, um, about the fire, the water, Monty begin, but any others, yours or others that um, you'd like to recommend, or you can also think about it. If you were a kid, what would be on your ideal summer reading list? So, so oh, like to this off. yes, this is my favorite question. Um, also a novelmind.com, a novelmind.com is the website that I work on. It's a resource with for all kinds of books. There's a database with over a thousand books. You can plug in search parameters and find things for your particular child. But I have a pile here because from a novel mind, we review them and we have authors on for weekly blogs. And there's so many wonderful ones. This is um, Elle McNichols' latest, Show Us Who You Are. She wrote A Kind of Spark that's now a TV show. And she's just a wonderful writer. This is Lynn's Moonwalking by Lynn miller Lockman. That's amazing. All of uh, I have read all the books of all the panelists. Uh, they are all amazing. I love this one. It's about an ADHD girl. 54 Things Wrong with Gwendolyn Rogers. Really, really powerful book. Can You See Me by Libby Scott. That is a very popular book, a middle grade novel about a girl, autistic girl. I have this book here by Mira that is just beautiful. I loved this book so much, Mira. I really, really enjoyed it. The Very Best House in Town. Um, and there's picture books as well. Kaz Windness, who's an amazing autistic artist and friend, just came out with his picture book two days ago. It just came out called Bitsy Bat. And it's about fitting in at school. And it's about masking, really, about trying to cover up your, your differences so that you fit in and then realizing, oh, that's just not going to work. And doing it for, like, preschoolers. It's really a cool little book. Um, included, this is really a lovely book for any child. Really, I think every child should have this by Janine Sanders. It's just called Included, and it's just so lovely. Um, 
There's Too Sticky by Jen Malia, another great picture book. This is a great one for social emotional learning, Robbie's Roar by Tom Percival, to get at those meltdowns. Um, I've got so many of them, I'm so sorry. Ben, Benny J and the Horrible Halloween by my friend Savan Hong, who writes, you follow her on Instagram, it's Savan, S-I-V-A-N, Hong, and she's wonderful. And what else do I have for you? It was supposed to be Sunny from a series of sensory books by autistic author and illustrator, Samantha Cotterell. Um, oh, and I could do my own. Benji, the bad day and me, it's my picture book. <laughs> About two little boys, one autistic and his brother and how they sort of save each other through brotherly love. That is a fantastic list and I, I love Benji. Um, even though my kids are very big, I, I after I read it, I looked at them and thought, you're my little burrito. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of blanket burritos, <laughs> yes, in that book. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mike, do you have any recommendations for us? Sure. I mean, I'm going to recommend a couple of, uh, well, one that's a YA novel, um, and it's by, it's a, I believe this is the most recent YA by Monica Nijkamp, and and um, they, you know, they made their bones in publishing with their first book, um, This Is the End, which was like instant bestseller, and their books are harrowing, harrowing, like the kind of books that like emotionally eviscerate you, but in a good way, um, and so... Um, at the end of everything is is actually um it's it's like a post apocalyptic uh plague novel so like pandemic type novel so not not necessarily going to be the right emotional read for everyone um but uh there it, it, it's great and then um this is maybe cheating a little because this book doesn't actually come out until November but um Marquez uh has also um written a, previously a, a graphic novel called The Oracle Code that was young adult. Um their next graphic novel is is middle grade and it's called Ink Girls. Um and it is about um it is about uh, a, a printer's assistant, a girl who's a printer's assistant in a in a setting that's based on, I believe, it's seventeenth century Italy, um, and dealing with um a a, a an oppressive society um, that is imposing censorship on the people. And I've gotten a glimpse at some of the first few pages and it looks um, fantastic. So those are my recommendations. Excellent. Tiffany, do you have any recommendations for us for summer reading? Any books that should be on our... I feel so odd out because I haven't feel like I haven't read any books in like a year. Um, <laughs> I just finished, and I'm probably late with this. I just finished um, The yes. Reason I Jump. <laughs> like, I feel like it's been out for eons, but I just finished it. Like, someone bought it for me. I just finished it. I absolutely loved it because, you know, my, my son doesn't speak. So it just was something that I like related to so much and then it was kind of like hard to get through because I'm like is this what my son goes through too like this is what I feel so I was like so like I just loved it I, I loved it it gave me a lot of insight and a lot of 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 hope and then also made me want to like reevaluate all the ways that you know I can connect with my son and it was just a, it was a beautiful book. I absolutely loved it. I feel like I'm late to the party on that one. I was like, just finished this book. Now my friends are like, it's been out for years. I was like, okay. You know, so like my friend just sent me, um, what is it? I don't even know what that. Oh, I don't think I have it over here. Um, it's in my living room. Um, the Kiss Quotient. I don't, I think it's like a, a good, Han Han, I think. I, yeah, I started that one. I'm enjoying it. I'm not that far into it, probably about 40 pages or so, um, but I'm enjoying it so far. Um, and then I learned that, you know, the author is also autistic too. So I was like, that's pretty cool. And it's like a series or something. So I'm like, I'm just gonna snatch them all up. <laughs> just cause. Um, I did read half of 
on the edge of gone. And then the next, but I will recommend that one then. So like definitely check that one out if you can. Um, but those are the ones I have so like so far. Um, if is it are we all doing just like young adult ones or can we just like anybody? Um, what anything? Well, I just ordered. Um, is it what what I say when I'm autistic or what I mean when I say I'm autistic by Annie? Um, I can't say her last name. Ah, I just ordered it. <laughs> I can't remember. It was. But um, I just ordered that one. Um, I think it's what I mean when I say I'm autistic. So I haven't read that one yet, but I've heard really, really beautiful things about it. Um, but yeah, those are the, the ones that, that I have. Great. Ivelisse, do you have any recommendations for us? Or Ivelisse, sorry. Sorry, I, I'm gonna power through this uh, special edition for uh, speculative fiction readers. So um, obviously uh, my book, Unseelie is a young adult fantasy with an autistic protagonist. Um, in the, I don't have them here with me, so I don't have a visual aid, but Flower Heart by Catherine Bakewell uh, was written by a friend of mine. And after I read an early version of it, I told her I connected to this character's like struggle to accept herself so much as an autistic person. And she had not made that connection while like writing it. And then she was like, oh, I think this whole book is about being neurodivergent. So I definitely recommend that one for uh, teen readers. Um, and I also think that if you're a parent or an educator or whatever, who is trying to get your nerdy kids away from Harry Potter a little bit, I think that the Blaze Rath Games duology by Amparo Ortiz is a really good jumping off point because they have all of the magical world building and sports and teen drama uh, with a Puerto Rican protagonist and uh, like a dragon based sport, which is really cool. And I am also uh, not a not a fantasy, but I am very much looking forward to it. I think it comes out in June or July. Uh, Tilly in Technicolor by Maisie Eddings is a uh, YA contemporary rom-com rom with an autistic protagonist. And I'm super excited to read it because all of Maisie Eddings' work has been so great. And last one, uh, Emily Seed's a uh, book, which I, I believe the second one in her, This Vicious Grace duology is coming out also this summer at some point, maybe later in the year. But This Vicious Grace, the first one is out and that is a young adult fantasy uh, with the like chosen one savior trope and a lot of romance and a very ADHD protagonist. So super cool to see neurodiversity in second world fiction. It's my jam. Excellent, Sarah, I know so Second Chance Summer has just come out. So it's on my list, even yes. if it isn't on yours. And I, as someone who's taken, um, gotten an early look at it, I can tell everyone it is a great read and excellent and definitely has also the yes. summer vibe. So and I'm going to actually talk about that. I know um, talking about your own book is a bit of a faux pas, but since this does fit the summer reading thing so perfectly, I kind of have to talk about it. Um, it's called Second Chance Summer. And um, it does have a neurodivergent element in that one of the characters, Maddie, who's based on me, I think you can tell which one's based on me because she's the one who looks like me, um, is um, she's dyspraxic and kind of a close cousin to autistic. And since she's based on me, I think you could probably see some neurodivergence there going on in all sorts of ways. And the, the premise of it is that there are these two girls, Maddie and Chloe, who used to be best friends, but now they're not because of something that happened in the school year. And, um, but they end up at the same cabin at theater camp together and they have to um, be together and put on a show Wicked. And it's kind of a very fun musical theater book that really, but also seriously delves into issues about friendship and it has a queer romance. And so if you like kind of summer themed books, I kind of have to recommend that one, but I'm not just going to recommend myself because I realize um, that's that's not what I want to do. So um, for, for any, um, 
I always recommend um, if you like you or your kid likes fantasy books, my critique partner, Adriana Cuevas, has so many wonderful fantasy books. They're funny, they're um, they're very readable. And she, she has a new one out that I would definitely read, but really any of her books, starting with the Total Eclipse of Nestor Lopez, are really fun summer reading. Um, Jen Wilde has a new thriller out that I've started reading and really enjoyed. I, it, the title really escapes me right now, but it's a thriller with an autistic main character that I love. And so that, that's kind of more for the YA crowd. And then this is kind of an adult recommendation because it's probably a bit inappropriate for kids, but Talia Hibbert's books, which feature um, autistic or neurodivergent protagonists, kind of romance for adults, they're, they're wonderful. And so for someone who's for either adult or a mature teen, they're, they're a great choice for kind of a fun summer romance read. And finally, Lynn, do you have any recommendations for us before we delve into the Q&A? I sure do. And thank you for the recommendation of Moonwalking, Sally. Um, Moonwalking set in the 1980s. Um, and another book, I love historical fiction and a book I love with an autistic protagonist. In fact, a nonverbal autistic protagonist, beautifully written story set in 1986 um, at the time of the Challenger disaster is Nicole Pantaliakos's Planet Earth is Blue. And another book, a recently published book, Middle Grade Contemporary, and Planet Earth is, is Blue is a, is a middle grade novel. Contemporary middle grade novel, verse novel, like Moonwalking, that just came out is Meg Eden Kuyat's Good Different. I just, I love that book. And, you know, the story of um, a middle schooler who is about to get kicked out of school uh, for, um, for hitting a classmate who pulls her hair or messes with her hair. Um, and and how she um, learns to you know how how she learns to value herself when a whole lot of people are counting her out. So good, different by Meg Eden Kuyat, K U Y A T T. And Meg is actually a local Maryland author, since you know X Minds is a Montgomery County, Maryland organization. Um, and it's wonderful. Um, so I think now we'd love to open it to audience Q&A. Um, so Melanie, do you wanna get us started with that? Sure, of course. Um, so in the chat, the first question is, um, this question is specifically to the BIPOC authors. For a long time and still to an extent now, autism is considered a white person's thing. Is there anything extra you feel you have to do to communicate this isn't true? No, no, wait, I'll go. Um, I mean, I, I think just being open about it is a way of doing that. Um, being, you know, public and you know out about being autistic while at the same time being Asian American and understanding that um there are you know bigoted assumptions about both of those that um often dovetail um I I try not I mean I don't necessarily make a conscious effort to go point by point with those things um but I try to be um you know, unashamed and fairly loud about being openly autistic. And I think that that is, in a lot of ways, um, uh, addressing it as strongly as I can. Okay. Um, so here's a question that was um, sent in during um, re registration. Um, how do you overcome anxieties surrounding publishing material that is fairly individualized, the experience of autism. I feel that it could open a lot of doors for criticisms, so you must be careful. Um, I will, I can do this briefly, um, because I think my answer to this honestly ties into an answer to the previous question. 
Um, I've said that I think that there are certain people who would only recognize my main character as autistic if I had made her a white boy. Um, and that's because there are so many misconceptions about what autism is and what that looks like. And I feel like in both of these cases, it's not my responsibility to force people to understand. All I can do is present the best writing, the best representation that I can, something that is authentic to my experiences and the experiences of other um, people who have, you know, a different presentation of autism than the very like cold white male stereotype that we're used to seeing. And I think there are way more people who see that and say, oh, this is just like me. Oh, this is like someone I know. Or, oh, I didn't realize that that's what autism could look like. And I'm glad that this opened my mind. I think that those people way outnumber the people who are going to critique or say, oh, no, you're wrong. Your lived experience is wrong. And um, I just hope to keep uh, skewing those numbers more and more. Um, yeah, I would totally agree with that. And um, in my experience, you kind of, you do kind of get it from both sides. And I've had people say, no, 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 this character isn't autistic. But then on the other hand, you'll have people complain that the characters are too, um, one, one reviewer has complained that in one of my books, the characters are too stereotypically autistic because they flap their hands. And so just kind of that experience, you kind of realize at some point you can't win. And really what all I can do as an author is block Goodreads on my computer, which it has been blocked for the past two years now, I think. And Occasionally I'll um, unblock it just to, just to take a check, but I think that has been really great for my mental health. And I just try to remember kind of the people who I write it for, the people who write it and say, that, oh, this is me. That, um, a few months ago, I went to a school visit and they talked about being autistic. And in the middle of my presentation, a young girl just came up and whispered to me, I'm autistic too. And so I just think, okay, I'm writing for her and not for the people who have like very narrow misconceptions of what it means to be autistic. And just those people I try to block to the extent that I can, because frankly, um, I don't have the mental space for it. Um, here's a question from the chat. Uh, what do you think is a big difference between growing up knowing that you're autistic and finding out about it when you're an adult? Who would like to answer that one? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I was I, I was diagnosed at 18 and I was before children. Um it was suspected earlier. I went through ABA. Um it, it's hard for me to answer that question because I was diagnosed at a point in my life where I was like still kind of kid but also entering adulthood and that is a really difficult time period in our lives and um it's being like sandwiched in between all these different different worlds and these different um, school of thoughts and it's suspecting you have something that people can't quite explain or grasp and then bam here's this diagnosis and this it could explain all the things that you feel is is makes you different from those that are around you but it's it's really difficult to look at, compare those existences up against one another because while there were suspicions, I didn't have confirmation until I was 18. And then I'm looking at my children who I had probably three years later after being diagnosed and my oldest being diagnosed at 17 months. And I'm still trying to come to terms with the diagnosis I officially had for four years. And um, 
trying to, 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 to pair that up with his life and his experience and then have my youngest be diagnosed as well. And they're going through their childhood with this diagnosis. They're gro literally growing up with it. And I'm looking at them and trying to pair their experiences up with, with mine in which I only just suspected I was just so weird that nobody wanted to be around me and I had to do this special type of therapy so that I could be around people and I didn't have a name for it and I'm trying to to pair that experience up with them and see if if our experiences align if we are going through similar things if we have a if we're going to have a similar outlook when they would turn 18. Like what is their life going to be like when they're 18 and they've known since they were really young about this diagnosis versus when you, you know, learn about it when you're an adult. And that's just still something that I'm trying to trying to figure out what that big difference is. Because I see a difference in the type of I see a difference in how I perceive autism with just me being diagnosed at 18 and diagnosed at a time where there wasn't this social media boom, there wasn't this neurodiversity community, there wasn't any of these things. And then I'm coming into this social media world three years ago and it's there. this big neurodiversity community. I'm trying to see where I fit in, in it, I'm trying to see you know, how my views align with those who were just diagnosed or, or um, recently diagnosed or just trying to figure out where I fit in with that. So this is just a lot of different um, people's experiences and, and situations and circumstances that, you know, make that question, I think, kind of difficult to like answer I think we'll have like a lot of similarities, but then there'll be like a lot of differences just depending on how, you know, how our lives, you know, have gone and, and you know, and the things that we've experienced and where we've grown, grown up and um and our beliefs and 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 honestly how we were treated growing up as well and and things like that. I think there's you know, some people who felt feel as though the diagnosis in a lot of ways has freed them in a lot of ways, you know, from and, and, and I felt the opposite when I was diagnosed because I didn't have community. I, I didn't have those things. I didn't have, you know, an online space I can go to. I didn't have a group I can go to. I didn't have a friend I could talk to. I, could, I didn't have all these things. So I didn't feel free from it. I felt more restricted by it. I felt more confined by it. I felt more off different and and excluded and it was something that I didn't want to be and I tried to not be um so yeah I just think it just depends on on the that that person their experience their histories their context and everything that um they go through to see you know to to, to answer that type of question everybody's experiences is so different and stuff and I think that Kind of also bringing it back to the previous question about the criticisms and stuff. It's just, it's, there's no one way to be autistic. And like Sarah was saying, you try to block all those extra, those things out. Um, my autism is not going to be like somebody else's. Um, and there's a lot of things that we share, but there's so much that we share that, that, that's different. And so it's, it's just trying to, 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 everyone's trying to find their place in this world and in their footing. And, and I think that acknowledging, you know, our differences is just as important as acknowledging our similarities. And so I, I wouldn't know the difference. I just think that it just varies from person to person on when, you know, what their lives are like. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, I don't think that age at diagnosis is like a definitive axis that you can measure things across because it's one of so many different factors that affect each and every one of us in, in a unique way. So 
you know, I'm human. So I do speculate sometimes like, what if I had been diagnosed when I was eight, you know, 45 years ago? Well, I would have been diagnosed at a time when people were not getting diagnosed who present the way that I do. So I wouldn't have been anyway. Um, and if I had, it was at a time when, you know, misinformation about autism ruled even more than it does now. Um, and would my experience growing up in terms of my family been different? I don't know. Uh, traditional Korean families, immigrant Korean families are not great in addressing uh, matters of mental health and neurodivergence. It's not it's not a very terribly, you know, not 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 all of our families have a very terrible like uh, open mindset about that. So I don't know how different my own experience would have been. But even if you look at, you know, I don't know if I if I if I think about the autistic kids in my life, and there are quite a few of them who um, are, are, you know, are or have been diagnosed or not diagnosed around that age, you know, if we use eight as an arbitrary measure, um, you know, I know one child who was diagnosed at eight and is doing great because um, their parents um, are wholly supportive and um, entirely um, committed to um, doing things for the benefit of their child. And I know another person, another another eight year old who is who is diagnosed, who is in a much worse situation because not because their parents don't love them, not because their parents don't care and not because they're not trying, but because they are doing all the wrong things anyway. They're exploring all the wrong solutions. They are, you know, they are proponents of ABA. Uh, uh, they are um, very much into um, behavioral change. They are very much about like mourning the child that they wish they had had instead of, um, engaging with the child that they have now. So um, there's so many other factors that that affect it that I, I don't think you can use that as a distinguishing factor in and of itself. All right, thank you so much. Um, I just wanna let you know, I mean, the, the, the time just has gone by so quickly and I, I'm gonna ask you one last question, um, but there are so many good ones that people have written, um, but here's, one of my favorites. Um, what questions have children asked you about your books or stories? Um, and I just like this question because it's asking from the child's perspective. Um, depending on your genre, you could ask you could answer that as um, you know what are what questions are most commonly asked by your readers or do you have like a a question that was really unique that a child asked you. Um. I have actually, I've got a lot of great questions from children. But my very favorite is this, and I think children um, in Vivi Cohen, um, this is a bit of a spoiler, but there's a bully character who's just terrible to Vivi throughout the entire book. And in the end, she sort of yeah, tells him off, but he doesn't really get his come comeuppance. And so kids have asked me, why doesn't he like get what he deserves? And I love that question because I think it kind of shows how we're conditioned to believe that bullies should get what they deserve. But my answer is because in real life, they often don't. And I wanted to show in real life that oftentimes the bully characters don't get what they deserve. And so that's my favorite question that I've gotten. I wrote a blog post about a wonderful question I got from Rogue, which was my first book featuring an autistic character that came out in 2013. Uh, my main character is Kiara, and she wanted to be popular, so she sat at the popular girls' table, whereupon one of the girls pushed her tray to the floor. And the question I got from the kids was, why did Kiara want to be popular? And I was, I mean, I was like that when I was growing up, I wanted to sit at the popular girls table. I wanted to be popular. I wanted to be in the middle of the social group rather than on the outside looking in, uh, not realizing that when I actually got invited to parties once in a while, they were loud and overstimulating and I really wanted to go home. But yeah, the question of why did Kiara want to be popular? I um, got an email from a teen reader earlier this week that had a question that wasn't about Unseelie specifically, but the question at the end of the email was, after you finish the sequel, are you going to keep writing books about autistic characters? And I was 
I was really moved by the email in general because like this is a teenager who cared enough about this to reach out but also that question specifically because it it felt to me like someone who like I think so many of us have in the current like let's cash in on diversity kind of climate where it's like is this a novelty is this a one-off like is this something that you know is like allowed to be a thing and um so I I replied like the same thing that I told my agent when I signed with her which is just so you know, I have lots of ideas for books and all of them have autistic and neurodivergent main characters. So I hope that that is something that you and publishing are ready for because I, no one expects neurotypical authors or holistic authors to stop writing char characters who are like them. So I don't think that it should be any different for the rest of us. And yeah, I loved it. Okay, well, I think we're about out of time, unfortunately, but what a great discussion. Um, I just wanted to, uh, well, I wanna thank the audience members for joining us tonight. And I hope this panel has given you lots of new ideas for new neurodiverse voices in your summer reading. Uh, we will put together a list. Uh, I know it was requested in the chat. We put together a list of all those recommendations from our panelists. Um, so we'll put that together and we can send that out along with the link to the recording of this uh, discussion. Um, and I want to thank you, Mira, so much for facilitating this great discussion. And a big thank you to all our author panelists, Tiffany, Ivelisse, Mike, Sarah, Lynn, and Sally. It was really a wonderful exchange and I really enjoyed it and got tons of ideas for reading. Thank you so much for joining us.